Hello everyone, my name is Caroline Nicolet and I'm an archaeology educator and direct Pario Gallico, a UK-based company offering living history and ancient craft demonstrations to museums and heritage sites. This talk will focus on Iron Age wall paintings. I would like to start by the archaeology and present a few finds that I will focus on. Then I will present the starter experiment that I have been running in order to develop more in-depth experiments later on. Then I finish by the public engagement tools that will reuse this experience gained from the experiments. For the archaeology, I would like to mention that the Iron Age I will be talking about is the French Iron Age, so usually 800 BC to 52 BC. Um, I will focus mainly on the earlier part of this Iron Age. Now, there are many sites in France, or several sites in France, that present uh, remains of Iron Age wall paintings. I will focus on the site of Vix, mont la in Burgundy, where the late 5th, 5th century BC huge building has been discovered um, quite recently. You can see a restitution of the building with a large um, absidial back, so a rounded back, on the left there. Um, this restitution presents only two colours, the yellow and red ochres that have been presented on the wall paintings that have been discovered in trenches and post holes at the start of the dig. So this has now been reviewed. So why do we study wall paintings? We usually find burnt door fragments still bearing the paints and these can give us very important information about the architecture of the building that usually degrade. So not just the composition of the wall, of the daub itself, but also the size of the wattle, the presence or not of squared beams or um, wooden structures that usually disappear. We can have uh, more information about the composition of the coats of daub, then render, then paint, that usually compose these walls, and that's quite new to, um, to many of us, because it's usually portrayed in reconstruction as a single layer of smoothed daub, when the archaeology tends to show that there are many different coats on many different um, fragments. Now, we also get, obviously, information about the colours and the pigments that were used at the times, sometimes the tools, different sizes of paintbrushes, for example, and the general idea of a decor, of an um, artistic composition that can be put in parallel with um, remains on pottery, on objects and other things. But mainly, my interest is to know more about the architecture of the walls of the building, both the ceilings, potentially, the floors, but also the openings in the walls that usually are not taken into account. And you can see in the centre top of the photos, for example, that these little fragments tend to show that there might be some, I wouldn't call them windows, but openings of various sorts that are present in walls that we don't find in archaeology. So this on the left is the most complete restitution of a composition of a wall panel painted from the Iron Age, around 5th century BC for this one, and it comes from Venungen in central Germany. Uh, we can clearly see two sizes of paintbrushes have been used to paint the decor, but also the composition itself is separated in different sections with a lower part with more uh, wider bands than a top where the little dots um, have been painted in, in a more of a group. Unfortunately, it's not as complete, it's not as impressive as Roman frescoes and Pompeian uh, buildings, of course. But we absolutely can say that in the Iron Age, an earlier time period now in northwestern Europe, people were painting both inside and outside their houses, were treating their walls extremely well, and had very um, voluntary patterns put on the walls. It's not just a case of dipping your hands in paint and smearing everything over a wall. Apart from the archaeology, there's also a very important difference to be made between a paint and a dye. It's a very common misunderstanding, but a paint is composed of non-soluble coloured pigments, particles, uh, mixed in a binder. This, when used, will sit on top of the surface and when drying will adhere, will stick to the surface. Whereas a dye is composed of soluble coloured molecules dissolved in a, in a solvent. When that is used, 
on fabric, for example, as a material, it will be soaked into the fabric and when drying, the dye will stay inside the material. Dyes are usually made out of organic matter, uh, plants, roots, lichen, fungi, etc. When pigments are usually made out of minerals, oxides, so ferrous metallic oxides, or salts. For the starter experiments, I focused on four different topics. The surfaces, the binders, so the mixers for the paints, the pigments and the brushes. And just as a reminder, this is um, my first little replica of a mid iron age shield based on the lovely tiny Salisbury Hoard um, shield, one of them. And that's to remind me that everything started with the question, how can I paint an iron age shield? And they were much easier to transport than iron age walls for displays. For starter experiments on the surfaces, I mainly had two experiments. The first one, uh, 2013, in Samara Archaeological Park in northern France. This, I had the opportunity to paint directly on a pre-constructed um, clay daub building. Now you can see on the left hand side where the green arrow is, somebody had tried to, to smooth this wall by applying a very thin coat of liquid clay straight on the daub. The problem was, it was very hot, we were in the middle of the summer, and the wall was extremely dry. So that completely cracked and fell off. I just brushed it off to apply the paint. So mainly that will be a clay daub and quite smooth surface. Whereas the lower part, so the most recent experiment at the Ancient Technology Center in the UK, is the internal wall of a, of a round house. Um, you can see on the right hand side again, that this wall is a bit rougher, um, it's not as smooth a surface, but also it had been coated with um, a chalky water to make it really white, really impressive and get the pigments to, to stand out. Now the problem with this wall um, has been that the surface was quite dry but also dusty. So after cleaning it and dampening it quite a lot, eventually the pigments managed to stay. And that impacted on the binders used for the paints. So on the left hand side you can see that that was Samara's experiment with water. So it was just a case of mixing ochres, different earths, with water and applying it to a slightly dampened wall. Now you can see that the paint started crackling, um, cracking a little bit. And that's mainly due to the fact that you have to take into account the outside temperature, uh, the time of the day, the dryness of the wall, etc. Otherwise it worked really well, was easy to apply, but unfortunately I couldn't follow the evolution of the paint itself as the house has now been destroyed. Um, on the right hand side this is the result of the experiment with casein paint, so milk based paint that was used at the Ancient Technology Center. As you can see on the top right uh, photo there, you have little scales coming out of the wall. I have to say that this paint is extremely strong and you can use a dampened cloth to actually clean it. You can brush it and no pigment will come out of it. But I think the fact that it was very dusty and very dry uh, on the wall when the pigments were applied, even dampened, um, provided sort of a not so good attachment for the paint itself and the binders to actually stick to the wall. On the top left hand side you can see some little patches of mold that appeared. Um, weirdly enough this didn't smell <laughs> even if it was a casein paint so protein based paint and they disappeared by themselves. They still come back a little bit from time to time but that depends on um, the number of fires that are actually lit in the house throughout the winter or when the weather is bad. And the last problem I had on the bottom uh, right of the photos is that I didn't think that the public and especially the school children would really like to peel off all these little flakes. So the most damage to the paint is usually in the lower part of the walls and it's mainly due to the public. One of the focuses of my starter experiments and still work nowadays is the pigment making process from gathering coloured earths, coloured stones um, around the UK, southern UK usually, to crushing them and using the levigation method, which is 
putting these crushed pigments in water and separating the very heavy grit and sand that falls at the bottom to the lighter coloured particle that will stay in suspension in the water, then poured in a dish, left to dry and evaporate, uh, usually in the sun, and you will get the finest pigment particles left at the bottom of your dish. Once crushed, this will turn into a paint that you can store quite easily and can use with a binder. This is an example of my Iron Age palettes and the very important question I would love to know more about and learn about is were there imported colours as well? There's an extremely wide variety of colours that one can get from a local environment but were they traded? From how far would be my next question. The last part of these experiments is about the brushes that could be used and in general the tools. They can be very simple and start with a chewed twig of debarked willow for example. Um, you can have quite a lot made with feathers and the rest is animal hair for now. Now I also used in the top left hand corner, mainly with children, um, a grass paint brushes just to explain that maybe some of the tools we are trying to find a bit more about were genuinely made out of grass, which is a completely degradable material, will never be found in archaeology, never mentioned, and is extremely efficient. I usually use these to paint on larger areas of wall, larger surfaces, and you only need a handful of grass cut to size. You don't even need a handle at all, but this was of course to um, to show the public that you can make a very decent paintbrush looking brush out of completely foraged materials. Now I'm hoping to try out fewer um, smaller paintbrushes, finer ones, a bit like in the top right hand side for these ones that I found in Prague completely by chance. Um, that probably are 20th century and are still made out of very fine animal hair but the handles are made out of the quills of uh, goose feathers or bigger birds feathers which I find very interesting. Working myself as an archaeology educator with my company Pario Gallico but also on other sites I had the chance to be able to experiment with putting all these experience and all these results into public engagement activities. They usually are demonstration, so ancient craft demonstration, living history displays, but also really hands-on activities for any type of age um, and various types of public, but also courses and workshops, both for individuals and experimental archaeology students. I will also talk about the visible concept of experiments and the recreations of the houses that are still on site. For any type of displays or activities, I usually try to get people to understand the difference between paints and dyes, how to make mineral pigments, how to make the paintbrushes and what kind of binders people could have used at the time for different surfaces. Now, the last one was at the Scottish Cronach Centre, uh, this summer in 2020, and very interestingly had been combined with another more modern activity where visitors could take a pebble from the beach, paint it with ancient pigments, usually ochres, and make it into a giant piece of art, a uh, form of fresco um, about COVID-19 and the whole pandemic. So that really started a whole reflection process about um, using paint making and pigment making as well as art to support mental health, to welcome uh, homeschooling education groups, uh, school groups of course and uh, special need groups that we will work more and more with usually on some different sites um, and all the way through this pandemic hopefully. As a last point I would like to mention that what visitors see they remember and it can be a historic outfit, a display or a building, but this will make a huge impact on their understanding of each time period. So I would like to reach out to all of you who might have Iron Age Northwestern European buildings on your sites and ask you to potentially consider the idea of painting and rendering really well the inside and the outside of these buildings to provide this new vision of a prehistory that we don't really see very often for the moment. Thank you for listening.